Um, and welcome to my talk, The Arcane Arts of Linux, which I know it says Lunic, uh, Unix, but yeah, Linux. So, who am I? I'm March, or some of you might know me by my, my real name, which is Alistair. I'm a security consultant at MDSEC. Um, I'm a pen tester. I'm a researcher. I do forensic work. Um, my sort of areas of expertise are kind of Linux malware, and they're also mainframes, which is a weird mix, I know, but there you go. Um, I also like Fortran, and this is why this slideshow theme is so terrible. It's because I love terrible ones. Um, you can find me on Twitter and on GitHub there. Uh, so what is this talk? So my, my brief about it was a little bit vague and a little bit short, but basically... I wanted to talk a little bit about tool development and techniques for Linux. So things like how sort of I've gone about building a framework for making implants and exploitation sort of stuff. Um, I want to kind of go over some of the stuff that's actually out there as well in terms of like what kind of malware is there at the moment, what's the state of it, how can we take some ideas from it. Um, I also want to discuss some things I've been working on over the past probably eight months, give or take. And maybe, maybe if I'm comfortable with the code, I'll release them in like a day or two. Um, the rationalizations for doing all of this, and I wanted to share some unusual discoveries I've, I've, I've found. What this talk is not going to be about is Red Team War stories, anything incredibly super technical, um, any O'Days. Unfortunately, we're just going to have to fish people and move ladders into these Linux boxes. That's it. That's the way it is. And really, you can summarize this as me reading man pages for fun in my spare time, because that's the kind of person that I am. Um, so, I like Linux, but one of the problems I find is that most of the Red Team material I see out there tends to focus entirely on Windows. It's all going to be written in PowerShell, it's all going to be Windows domain specific, um, and it kind of disappoints me because Linux is actually quite popular still. You still find Linux servers in every estate, um, and we should, I think we should have some kind of focus on that. There aren't really any guides for how to build an implant or start to create your own thing or build a tool chain for compiling stuff. Um, there's, there's very, very little in the way of any kind of post-exploitation. Um, like on Windows, you'll have like the entire Metasploit framework has so much that you can use in Meterpreter. And there is like the Linux Meterpreter, but I find it's completely lacking in comparison. And there are also, you know, obviously other Windows things. Um, and what little tools that are out there that are like really high quality tend to be things that have been leaked or they're slightly a bit eh, and I don't sort of trust them. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, let's, let's, let's talk about what there actually is out there. So from the pen tester side of things, whenever I see people doing Linux jobs, especially ones that are a little bit more offensive, mostly what I see people do to retain access to things is stuff like SSH keys. You know, you'll drop your, your key and authorize keys and that'll be it. You'll occasionally see people, if they're doing exploits, they'll normally reverse shell out using Python or Netcat. It's, it's all pretty, pretty standard stuff. The only real post-exploitation I ever see is when people have been dropped into a shell from an exploit, they'll run Python, import PDY, pdy.spawn, bin sh. Um, and also, like, on, on, if you're doing it, you know, a web app and you've shelled it, I have seen people genuinely upload like C99 from paste bin onto it. We're, you know, we, we should probably be, be doing a little bit better than this. Um, it's all very, very manual. There's no automation. There's basically you're in control every step of the way, which is fine, but it's a little bit problematic when you're doing a job that maybe requires you to mass exploit a number of things and retain access to them. Um, in terms of the pros, these things are at least quick to deploy. I mean, again, I, I literally know that Python one-liner off the top of my head. And they're native, they're built-in Linux tools normally, so you won't need any specific sort of libraries. You don't need to go through the hassle of compiling something and putting it on the box um, and, and making, you know, debugging it and testing it and making sure it works. On the other hand, the cons are that it is the least stealthy thing in the world. It is like screaming, I've owned your box, I'm there, I'm in there, and, and just not even trying to hide. Um, there isn't very much functionality in terms of these things. If you've got a reverse shell, you basically just have bash um, and no added bonuses. It's, it's down to you because it's so manual whether you want to do anti-forensics kind of things. Um, and I mean, like we're talking like plain text reverse shells, which is a really bad idea. And we shouldn't be doing that on like client things. Um, on the black hat side of things, uh, I hope you like DDoS spots because that's nearly 90% of it. And the 10% that isn't is either Perl DDoS spots or it's Bitcoin miners or Monero's, I think, the new hot thing. Um, 
there's no post exploitation at all. There's no manual interaction from their side. They are scanning the internet and never actually touching anything. You know, occasionally, they might go to their IRC and like send a command to ping flood something, but that's as far as they're going to go. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very automatic process with no intelligence behind it whatsoever. Um, so there's plenty of features. They are all DDoSing features, but they're still there. Um, there's also absolutely no stealth or anything like that involved. It's very unintelligent. It's loud. It's spray and pray. You're just trying to hammer everything as quickly as you can. Um, so yeah, it's it's there's not a whole lot there that's actually any good apart from the automation, and even that's not great. Um, in terms of like the nation state APT stuff we see on Linux, this is a little bit more interesting. Um, so we actually have a relatively good grasp of what's going on here. Uh, because of the shadow brokers and the Vault 7 leaks, we have access to manuals, we have access to binaries, in some rare cases we have access to source code. Um, the Vault 7 leaks are pretty fantastic because you have what is essentially their entire like um, uh, sort of development process, you have their comments on their development processes, you have all of that, you can see why they've done things. Also because they are a nation state, they are like holding themselves to quite a high standard, so they've all got good crypto. So I don't know if you've, uh, if anyone here has looked into them, but the Vault, the Vault 7 have all used like a Polar SSL, um, which is now called Embed TLS, which is a tiny like SSL library with a limited attack space. So that's pretty good. And it's also been audited um, independently as far as I'm aware. So again, also great. Um, and the Shadow Brokers, they, they are having good leaks. Yes, great success. Um, they have leaked a load of stuff with a lot less documentation, a lot less content in terms of sort of context and how it works, the best you can really hope for are those badly written text manuals that they seem to drop in everything that are sort of like a step-by-step -step for the operators to run through that literally just gives them the commands that they copy and paste. Um, but like, you can kind of get some context from that. You can work out how the tools work. You can work out how they're supposed to be used. You can work out what they're supposed to be targeting. Um, and the code itself, what you see of it is fairly clean. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot, but it is there. There's also... A third toolkit, which I would consider as one of the main nation-state Linux ones, which is the Turla or Penguin toolkit. Um, it's pretty well documented. Um, if no one's familiar with it, actually, I think it may come up in another slide, but if it doesn't, I'll, I'll talk a about it now. Um, so it was an APT campaign that started in 1996. Um, the, it's from Russians, and basically you might know it as, um, uh, I think it's like Saturn Rain or Midnight Rain or something, Titan Rain, there it is, Titan Rain, um, and it had another name, and essentially it was this long-running APT campaign in the like mid-90s, so the, the sort of granddaddy of all of that, um, that is still going around today, and um, I want to say Kaspersky um were the guys who identified it but they found it because they found this really unusual linux backdoor on a uh, a server they were doing forensics on and um they, they they found out eventually that it turned out to be related to a tool called loki 2 which was released on frack in 1994 um and they they started thinking then this is really weird you know this is properly old school i wonder if we can link that to these these russian guys and so eventually they got their hands on a server that had all these logs, all these tools. They were able to connect those two. And you now basically, you have the base of this. So you have the Loki 2 toolkit, all of their codes that they use were public. And their, like their development is, is somewhat documented. So compared to where you, know, you might only have a single binary and that's it and it's stripped, this is has some information about it. Um, the pros and cons of these are that they're really well made. They're really resilient. They've clearly been tested on a lot of things. If you've tried using them, which I wouldn't recommend because you're using random binaries from the internet, um, they they are actually quite good. And um, they've all got really strong crypto. Um, they're all pretty stealthy in comparison to something that just lives in temp and spits packets at everything that they can see. Um, they try to avoid obvious attribution as well, which is kind of good. So, you know, you don't sort of have anything that makes it super obvious that you're around. Um, there's also so much post-exploitation stuff in this, um, which is, again, it's a different sort of style of attack to what you normally see from the pen testing side of things or the blackout side of things. Uh, the cons are I genuinely would not touch any of the binaries or run them on any of my own machines, and not least like a client machine. It would be the worst thing in the world. Um, they, they're so shady. Um, 
So a quick look as well about the Shadow Brokers, because again, they have the most sort of content. One of the things that's really interesting about this is they've got a toolkit called Green Spirit, um, or GS. It's a post-exploitation framework. If you've, it's, it's part of the, the Linux stuff that happened, uh, I think it was the second or third Shadow Brokers, um, leak. Um, it had a lot of features. Um, it had log cleaning, it had like time stamping where you alter the timestamps of one file to make it resemble the timestamps of another, or you make, you, you hot slide them basically. Um, it had like, they'd taken a list of signatures from RK Enter and CHK Rootkit and re-implemented them in their own tool. Um, which is, is cool, but, uh, they were looking for like worms from 2003 in, in 2013 and I was thinking that's, that's probably kind of pointless. Um, it had ARP scanning stuff, it had like, I think there was even some lateral movement things there. It was, it was very good. Um, and it had things for like scheduling tasks as well. So if they wanted to run a command in the future, they could like set up it to be scheduled using a number of different mechanisms. And it's, it's, it was interesting. It was written in Perl, um, but all of the modern bits from the last, the last like, say two years, so probably 2011 to 2013, um, that was written in Python, and it's, it's that kind of struck me as interesting. It sort of matched up with how InfoSec has changed generally. Like we, we we all had like Perl in the early two thousands, and now we're on Python. So you can kind of vibe with their uh, their development style. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, everything there is interesting. But I thought I'd like to give it a shot. I'd like to see if I can build something a bit more fun. And so this is my design. Hopefully, someone gets this reference, and it's not just a random guy. <laughs> Um, so as a base, I wanted to use something with really simple, really clean code. Um, there are lots and lots of tools out there that are, are public and that you can take and you can use. I could have written something myself from scratch, but I'm lazy and I want something that goes quickly. I don't want to go through the whole process of developing it. So I picked uh, a backdoor called TSH. Um, it's very functional. It's, it's, it doesn't have much in the way of features, to be fair to it. It has file upload, file download, the uh, interactive shell with PTY. But it's, it's good. It's tiny code. It's stable. It has strong crypto. Um, and it's been used by the CIA and China in various different variations and forms. Um, the one that I use is one that was uh, modified by a friend of mine called Darren. Um, our info docs on Twitter, he added SCTP support. So if no one's familiar with that, it's kind of like a protocol similar to TCP and UDP on the same layer, but most firewalls and firewall configurations just sort of ignore it and you can, you can just walk right out. Um, TSH has no real dependencies as well, which is one of the things I was looking for. I wanted something that could be standalone and wouldn't cause any sort of issues if I was dynamically compiling it um, versus statically compiling it, or if I was statically compiling it, it wouldn't end up being 30 MB in size. Um, which I, I tried to prevent as much as possible. Um, so I started by choosing a C library because while you could statically compile something with GNU libc, what happens is you do end up with a two megabyte binary. And if you're trying to shuffle that around the client network all the time, that is going to be super loud and super obvious. So I went for Diet, um, which if anyone's familiar with, it's a very small C library. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty much the smallest one you can get. Um, it takes a bit of time to work and then get like TSHD to compile with it due to the fact that TSH uses some PDY functions that aren't in Diet. So you, I, what I did was I just stripped that out and I replaced it with just a standard fork and the exec to get us a, a normal shell. But I think you could probably take some time re-implement re a PDY shell in probably a day or two. Um, I also spent quite a bit of time playing around with compilers as well and flags. So probably for about a month, all of my spare time was trying to optimize this as much as possible and trying to remove any kind of debugging or like debugging symbols or anything like that. So GCC, PCC, Clang, I was pretty much going through constantly. And um, uh, there's also a toolkit called uh, Elf Kickers, which I found as well. It's really, really useful. It has a strip in it that is a lot more functional than the GNU strip that comes with the bin utils. Um, you can remove sections, you can basically strip a lot more data um, and that massively reduces the size. So by the end of it, I was compiling these really great static binaries for x86 that were about, I think, 50K in size, which was, which was good. That was kind of what I was looking for, but they still weren't very obfuscated. So <laughs> I decided I would uh, step up my game. Uh, so 
Infodux, again, he uh, revived the Packer from about a decade ago, and this is a PG talk, I forgot about this. So I'm just going to say that it, the name of this Packer begins with Elf, um, and if you want to know what it is later, I'll, uh, come and ask me. Um, and he decided to create a reverse engineering challenge, which he called the Hell Binary, which uh, was a bit of a pain to, to, to undo. Um, but yeah, this, this Packer is really, really great. So it only supports x86 at the moment, and the crypto is ancient. It uses like RC4 is I think the most modern thing, or maybe Blowfish. Um, but it does produce polymorphic binaries. There are no obvious strings in them. Um, it's relatively hard to signature as well because of the volume of like the actual amount of polymorphism. Um, I produced, I don't know, 30 or 40 different binaries and I was trying to look for patterns between them. And there isn't actually that much. It was the first, maybe I think it's 200 bits or something like that, that are obviously that, but yeah. Um, I think you can probably change that as well with a bit of work too, you can modify it, make it a bit more uh, difficult to signature. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean now what you end up getting is you have a tool chain which I then automated to produce these tiny binaries, they're polymorphically packed, they're platform agnostic in the sense that they'll run on x86 or x64, which is really good because occasionally on like client work you might find for example in NAS that's x86. And that can be a pain if you've got to recompile everything from x 54 And you can see uh, the output of LS there, it's 31k. And one of the things, uh, you can also see the file output, which is else invalid class and valid byte order. Um, because of the like, horrible mangling it does to the, uh, to the, the LFET. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a pain to reverse, to be honest. Um, the, yeah. Um, they're, again, the packed binaries are, unique, um, which is good in a sense of the polymorphism, it's, probably, it's quite hard to signature the content. But one of the problems I have with it is that the file header is, as you've seen before, really unique. You're not going to see that in a normal Linux box. Um, and if you were dropping these on disk and you're leaving them and someone is doing a find or someone is looking around, you, they will find that pretty quickly and notice immediately that that's dotty. Um, so ideally what you'd be doing is you'd be using a memfd, which I'll talk about later, to execute this in memory in Linux without ever actually touching disk. Or if you can't do that for whatever reason, it's an older kernel, uh, you'll run it from devshm and then delete it while it's while it's running. Um, there is some work that needs to be done to this packer, and it needs to be modernized. And, and but it's it's doable. Um, and one of the other downsides here is that there's no support for ARM or MIPS at the moment, so you'll find those as well quite regularly on like routers and things like that, or again NASes, um, and that would require an awful lot more work. But on the other hand, there is UPX for that. And I mean, I think while UPX doesn't produce polymorphic binaries, at least you can just strip out the really obvious strings all over the UPX binary that say, this has been packed by UPX. This is definitely packed by UPX. Guys, we're using UPX. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the other things that I was finding <coughs> with this is once one thing compiled fine, I could apply this tool chain to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so Nmap isn't too easy to statically compile with a non-standard like library and non-standard toolkit, but I was able to compile a strobe, an ancient port scanner from 1997 effectively, and it works, and it's really fast. It is actually comparable to Nmap a lot of the time. Um, and like just to test this, I took the um, like system V code that they released publicly a while back, maybe a year or two ago, and I started compiling like the the, bit, the the utilities from that. So like I have a system V ID that I can run now that's compiled with this tool chain and it's tiny and polymorphically uh, packed. Um, but yeah, there is an awful lot of work left to do on this. So I need to modify tiny shell to use a proper CNC because at the moment it is essentially file upload, file download, and a shell, or you can execute things. I'd much rather have an actual CNC <coughs> mechanism where they'll beacon out regularly and I don't have to like do a cron job or something like that for it. Um, and that way, you know, you can task things, uh, multiple agents, you can handle them a lot better. Um, it's called GNU Parallel. Hmm? It's called New Parallel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, New Parallel. I, I need that. Um, right now I've been using like a horrible mess of like... Um, I don't even want to talk about it, but it's, it's like a SOCAT and NETCAT in conference mode to get like loads of clients talking to each other. Um, I want to include more protocols as well than just the encrypted TCP because that's kind of, yeah, I, I think it's pretty noticeable if someone from a SOC comes and looks around. Um, ideally, I'd like to be able to hide a standard SSL or HTTPS traffic. Um, I mean, the one advantage of doing a lot of this stuff on Linux is not only is no one doing it anyway, but also no one is looking. 
Uh, so that's quite good. Um, I also want to do a little bit of modification to make it difficult to reverse engineer the binaries. So I've been working on that, and it's very, you, you basically, you know, I've done the simple things, no debugging attachment, stuff like that. Um, but you can still make the, the process core dump and you get all the unencrypted strings out of that. So, yeah, that needs a bit of work. But um, at some point, I'm thinking I might probably release, uh, release this build chain thing that I've, I've come up with. Um, so that's that's sort of my, my plan for making agents and how I've gone about it. Um, and now it's time for post-exploitation with a picture of orcs, which will be relevant in a minute. Um, so I'm not actually really familiar with anything on Linux for like proper post-exploitation with loads of functionality. There's loads of stuff on Windows, um, but on Linux you basically got the Linux interpreter. There's a couple of like paid frameworks that have their own custom implants of post-exploitation stuff. So there's Canvas and there's I think I want to say Core Impact is something as well, but I'm not 100% certain. Uh, there's something called I'm going to pronounce it as Puppy, but I have no idea how it's actually supposed to be pronounced. You know, it does only have one P, um, and they, but they, they don't really do the kind of things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that offers something relatively uh, comparable to the functionality in, in like Green Spirit, for example, except with less RK Enter. So I've started working on a tool that's called Orc, um, and it's, it's really quite a simple idea, but I needed something for post-exploitation on a job I was doing. Um, and it started as a component that was wrapped around SSH. And um, it was like a, a sort of a hacking harness, essentially, that would prevent me from doing things like logging in without the dash T flag to stop requesting a PTY and not appearing in, in logs. Um, but then once I did that, I started thinking that I was doing so much stuff manually that I needed to automate some of it. So I thought about it again for a bit. I thought about writing a hacking harness. If anyone's not familiar with the idea of a hacking harness, it's essentially something that wraps around uh, any 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 handling of reverse shells on your box when they come back in, and it'll automate certain things. It'll prevent you from doing mistakes, like again forgetting like dash t or forgetting to like wipe logs and stuff like that. Um, and I thought about doing it on on you know the sort of the, the client side, if you will. But then in the end, I decided I'd rather do it on the target side. Um, and essentially, it's it's a custom RC file that you load the shell. Um, it does. It, it actually has quite a few features at the moment. So um, it does the standard stuff. So it unsets hist file, it unsets hist size. Um, it reads itself and stores itself in an environment variable, and then it shreds itself, um, just because I don't want to leave it lying around. Um, it will, if you spawn a new like, shell, for example, it'll also make sure that that loads itself. Um, it does like time stomping, so it'll it has a bunch of aliases for like change, modifying times and stuff on various ways. Um, makes it a little easier than touch. Um, it has log editing functions, which I'm gonna be honest, while they work, I'm currently using UTMP dump, which is a built-in thing on Linux, which will just convert uh, like WTMP into plain text, um, and then can convert it back. And I'm just gripping them out. But one of the problems with that is it, when you repack it, it is always a different MD5. A couple of bytes are always <laughs> off, and it's a real pain. Um, I need to sort of come up with a better thing for that, but for now, UTMP that works fine. Um, it has aliases for all the, use, like, the usual things, like you know, PS ops and all of that. Um, one of the other functionalities it has is it can drop a tiny backdoor written in assembly that you can just set your ID to get root again if you need to or whatever. Um, PTY spawning, it uses either the Python thing or there's another thing which you can use if the box doesn't have Python, which happens. Um, there's a binary called script. Is anyone familiar with it? It's, uh, it was originally written to like record your screen sessions on Linux, so you could record like how your terminal went. Um, and for some reason, now it does this by actually spawning a brand new PTY. So if you're on a box that doesn't have a PTY and you need one, you can just run script on dev null and you'll, you'll pop a PTY with a native, uh, Standard Linux tool, it's great. Um, also, launching sudo su and ssh without using a PDY is pretty handy too, because if you do spawn one, you're going to be in a log somewhere, like WTAMP or whatever, saying PDY spawn. Um, you can use ask, it's, it's, this isn't very complicated. It basically just does an ask pass. It drops a little tiny bash script, and with the password that you specify, it'll launch a root shell with that, or it'll launch ssh or whatever. Um, I've also got something that essentially goes through all of the PTSs and dev PDS, um, it'll stack them, 
and it'll get the idle time and link what there is like the idle time down to the seconds and link what their PDY is currently doing, which is really, really helpful, I find, if you're on a box with someone actively on it. Like W is almost useless because all you'll see is someone like bash and then the idle time, which can be completely wrong, whereas this is a bit more effective. Um, I'm probably going to release this next month once I add a couple more features and once I, I think I am going to finish the actual like SSH harness that I was using, maybe get it to work better with the sort of standard netcat handlers. Um, I'm not a big fan of releasing code, so you're going to have to keep poking me on Twitter for this, but, but do that. Um, and credit to the Gruck, who's uh, not here, he's somewhere in Thailand, probably living the dream, um, for inspiring it with his hash tool, which was the, uh, the sort of original hacking harness. Um, and that locally wrapped around your, your, your evil shell. Um, and also a, a quick aside as well, just to advertise something I wrote myself again. Um, I also wrote a tool at the same time that basically does some checks for these kinds of things and for like malware and so on, on on boxes. And you can find it in my GitHub. It's called Suspect and it will only run in Fedora at the moment, pretty much. Um, but it won't take too much to modify. It's just certain like flags for PS that are Fedora specific. Um, and I kind of want to keep developing this at the same time as developing the stuff that I'm doing for sort of making this toolkit. Uh, just because it's nice to have a defensive thing as well. Um, and yeah, this is just essentially, I want to avoid MD5ing a bunch of files like RK100 does or whatever, or looking for like very specific files for malware because a lot of the time it's auto-generated now, right? You'll find like Chinese DDoS bots are, are randomly naming themselves and living in various different directories. Um, so I guess we are, we're finally onto just the interesting discoveries and the, these are sort of miscellaneous things that I've Explored. One of the things that I found is that once you start writing terrible bash and you try to decide, you know, what can I get bash to do, you find out that it is amazingly featureful and great. And there's like a thousand things you can like just abuse and exploit on Linux really weirdly. So LD preload, I talked about here two years ago, and that's originally like this debugging feature that allows you to force a li uh, program to load a library um, way up at the top of the chain. So you can use this to like hook functions and so on. Um, and when I was doing this research, I actually wrote my own <coughs> version of this rootkit uh, that was doing the rounds at the time. And I was using constructors and destructors to create a new persistence mechanism. Um, but one of the problems with it was I realized that once you find this, because it also, because it lives on disk, but also because it's so persistent, once you find this, if someone is, to, is going to find it, like, say, on a client engagement, they're not going to be able to remove it very easily, and they're not just going to ignore it and go away. That is the box basically burnt down. They're going to pull out the hard drive, they're going to thermite it, then they're going to call you and be like, we know you're there. Um, so I decided that it wasn't really going to work out that way. Um, and this is why I decided to basically build this toolkit, which is a little bit different. Um, so I don't really recommend persistence for precisely this reason. The more you touch this, the more likely you are going to be found by someone. Um, and people recursively will do a find on the file system all the time. Like you're trying to find, I don't know, your PowerPoint from a couple of years ago and you're like, what's older than two weeks? And you'll go through it all and you'll eventually, like someone will find your malware living in var TMP. And people are also using really predictable things. So you'll have like uh, .config auto start and people's home directory was used by the hacking team Linux malware. And I think it's used by some of the... Um, the Penguin Turtle guys as well. It's 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 all very predictable. It's all very common. It's obvious. If someone is doing some IR on your box, they'll find that. And um, also cron. Every bit of malware that's scheduled to rerun is always going to use cron. But there are other things you can use. So, for example, is anyone here familiar with DBus? It's the IPC for Linux. Well, hey, someone put up their hand. Um, but DBus has DBus services, and they're just desktop files that live in a DBus directory. Um, and you can you can basically debus will auto start this um, that lives in that exact path there, um, and they're pretty useful for persistence because you can start your binaries with debus send commands, or if you want to get complicated, you can start using them for IPC. So you can use debus to actually send messages between things, launch different things, have different components working that way, um, which is which is good. Um, but you're still using Dbus, which is horrible, so maybe not. Um, you've also got System D, which is even worse in general. Um, and in its hurry to devour the whole known universe, it's got a load of functionality at the moment, including a complete cron and at replacement in your init system. And I don't know why it has that, but it does. Um, 
So it has these things called timers, which function exactly like cron, or they can function like at. They can be just single-use tasks, or they can repeatedly run at a time, or they can... You can basically use it exactly like cron. And unfortunately, the one thing that I find about this is you need to create two different files for these, and it also means that you're doing a lot of system CDL stuff. So if there is anything like logging there, um, you're going to be all over the place. Um, so it's not really great. Um, there are other various little, like, little known miscellaneous persistence methods as well. So etc. procmailrc. Um, procmail is a, is a mail thing that comes with Debian. It's pretty popular. It uh, probably comes with a bunch of other districts, to be honest with you. But uh, the procmailrc file that you can put in etc can allow you with a certain configuration, which you can find in the man page, it's like the third thing, to arbitrarily get code exec based on just sending emails to a specific user on the server and it will run it as their uh, privileges, uh, which is really helpful. I've used it on jobs to, like, uh, to root things. Um, you could also do a really small LD preload wrapper around, and you could stick in something like um, SSHD service files that are preloads every time SSHD runs. It forks and executes a process, either using constructor or just hooking something. Um, you can use bash RC. And one of the things I found is that there is a surprising amount of files on like any Linux system that just essentially get executed by something at some point. Um, there's exfil as well. So um, there's, there's all the usual ways of exfil. You know, you can post data out, you can use HTTPS, you can use curl, use DNS. I mean, there's, there's tools that do this by default on Linux. You can do this with D, you can do this with anything. There's nothing fantastically new in this bit. Um, again, this, I'm not doing anything groundbreaking, but one thing I've been playing with is using system V message queues for storing stuff that I want to um, exfiltrate later. Um, I have been looking for where this stuff is stored on a Linux machine, and I cannot see it. I've done many, many recursive grabs. So I, I, I feel like, I hope like it's just living totally in memory. I'm sure it is living somewhere in some weird format somewhere, but it's not easy to grep it. So if you're like saving like clear text passwords, it's you, you won't find them, which is really convenient. Um, and one of the other things that's convenient is you can actually get an example client from the man pages on any box except for Ubuntu. Uh, you can compile it dynamically from STD with uh, STD in with GCC. And you can just use set to alter any of the code to, you know, so it's, it's got like this example code where it will just send a message. You can just send that out and make it so you can send whatever. Um, and it's something that I'm thinking about including with ORC, essentially, is the idea to quickly drop a message queue client that you can store stuff for later exfiltration um, with a single command. Um, and speaking of uh, executing things, uh, so one of the things I've also been playing with is pipes on Linux, so make FIFO, which will allow you to create a, a sort of bidirectional pipe. Um, I was thinking, I was hoping originally that you could actually use that to execute binaries. Um, just, you know, temporarily drop them, you run them once, and that's it. Unfortunately, you can't. But you can drop a bash script in there, and it's executed, essentially creating a one-use bash script that you can't read again. Um, and it's a little harder to find and do forensics on than just running something from, like, tmp hacker.sh. Um, and it's actually how Orc will drop itself in when it uh, runs, uh, like, when it forks off and runs a new shell. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty useful. It's uh, it's a bit of a pain, but yeah, it's it's cool. Um, I've also been playing around with uh, the dynamic linker and loader. Um, so this is so it's normally like uh, it, it live and live, and it's how the the kernel will dynamically link things to libraries. Um, if your program is dynamically compiled, it'll specify what the loader is in the interp elf section. Um, that will handle all of the libraries and whatever. And normally you'll just run it straight like you run ID or whatever. But you can actually specifically set this to interpret it and run the binary itself. And one of the really great things about this is if you're trying to avoid appearing in proc, proc.exe or proc.exe is normally where I pull out any malware that's running on a box and I'm doing forensics. It's the easiest way to get it out in normal L form. But if you run it with uh, libld and um, you will, when you try and pull out the binary, you'll just get the dynamic linker out of that. You'll have to actually pull the, the binary, the malicious binary out of memory, which is convenient. Um, you can also make it set cap as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, also, I mentioned memfd before, but if you've ever wanted to execute a binary in memory on Linux, now you can. Um, there's a tool called netelf, which is written by a friend of mine. And it downloads ELF executables directly from the internet and runs them in memory. And a MFD is essentially like a, a file descriptor that exists in memory and doesn't touch disk that was introduced in the kernel in 2014 for reasons that I have no idea why. It's a little bit like LD preload. I'm sure there are legitimate reasons 
But for me, all I can think about is abusing this and using this to like execute things in memory. Um, and it's, it's, it's really quite useful. There are still ways to detect this. So you will still see that in, in the prop list of file descriptors, you will actually see that it is a, a little, a little thing. Let, like if you ls it, that'll say it's an MNFD. So yeah, and it's not that common. I've not seen anything legitimately use this. So someone looking for it will find that. Um, and yeah, I mentioned again capabilities earlier. Um, so if no one's familiar with capabilities. They're kind of like set UID, but they don't count A as a normal permission, so you won't find them with just a fine for permissions. They're sort of a way of modularly um, providing privileged uh, features to a binary on Linux. So for example, ping on most modern Linuxes will have cap net admin, which allows it to create raw sockets, but not do any other root operations. Um, but you can also set things like cap set UID, which will let you run set UID to function and elevate yourself up to O. Um, and people will run fines for set UID binaries constantly. Um, like, it's, it's, it's the number one thing you'll do in a build review, for example. Anyone who's been compromised will probably do this, to, or who even suspects it will probably do this to see if there's anything suspicious going on. And one of the great things about capabilities is the only way I know of to, like, recursively find them is to list, uh, is to use find to print everything on the file system and then pipe that into, like, um, uh, get factor, which will then list them. Um, so, let's see. Other random sort of functionality that I find that's really useful on Linux is stuff like SSH keygen. So I was on a box um, recently on a network with essentially no real outgoing internet connectivity. Um, and I had no port scan or anything like that. It was my only way on the network. And SSH or SSH key scan, oh my, I typo did. It's actually called SSH key scan. Um, and basically what that does is it'll take a list of IPs and it'll grab the, like, pri uh, the, the, the fingerprint from all of them. Um, and you, you can essentially use it as a, a massive port scanner. Um, you've also got S-Trace, which is regularly installed and makes a perfectly serviceable keylogger on Linux. Um, I've combined uh, S-Trace and SSH key scan to basically port scan other ports as well in like a one-liner. It's really convenient. There's Exec, which allows you to conveniently change the name of any processes you launch. So let's say you're launching TSHD, it now looks like VBUS. It's, uh, these are all really useful built-in tools in Linux that you can use to hide if you're doing a red team job. Um, yeah, so concluding, basically, there are loads and loads of ways to do strange and weird things on Linux, and nobody really looks at any of this stuff anyway, so you can kind of experiment. Um, and I've been looking at, for example, some examples of red team sort of uh, defensive stuff, which is based on red team, where they're like, you know, if someone's catting etc. password, that's a little bit suspicious. But I mean, you can also just set your hist file to etc. password, load uh, Etc. password then into your actual history and memory and then just write history and you get the whole thing out. It's really easy to do pretty much anything on Linux. Um, and there's a whole like world of implant development out there to explore and hopefully people are a little bit interested in the idea. Um, because you can do things like create libraries that have a main and you can execute as a standard binary even though they're shared objects. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we sort of exhaust the world of Windows, we stop writing just focusing on PowerShell and C-sharp binaries and then uh, Cobalt Strike and things, and we start developing cool things on Linux, um, especially because no one is ever really paying attention. It's a lot easier to be stealthy on Linux. Um, and hacking harnesses, at least, do seem to be coming back. Uh, I was recently linked to something here. It's called FFM. I um, can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's a really cool hacking harness. I reckon you guys... Freedom fighting mode. Yes, thank you. Freedom fighting mode which is pretty cool. I reckon you guys should check it out. I will probably tweet it. Um, and yeah, that's my talk. And has anyone got any questions? <laughs> I'm keeping this. <laughs> Why do you think the state of play is so far behind in the Linux world? Um, really, I think it's because you don't actually need to work very hard in Linux. I mean, genuinely, just dropping a, a, an SSH key into, like, uh, authorized keys will do 90% of the time. No one really checks for these things. Um, and there's no, like, there's not really any AV, right? I mean, you've got, like, RK Hunter and CHK Rootkit, but they are relics of the 80s. I mean, they are literally looking for specific files with specific hashes from 2003, and they're useless, in my opinion. Which is, I hope no one here actually develops those or really likes them. I'm sorry for calling them useless. <laughs> No worries. 
Yeah. Ah. Have you looked into any GoLang-based backdoors for cross-platform and cross-architecture compatibility? Uh, so I've actually found some of those on uh, IR engagements and just me looking for malware myself. Um, but I've not looked too deeply into it, to be honest with you. They, 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 Go is definitely becoming more popular, and cross-platform Go seems to be pretty cool, but it's not something I've explored in detail, so I'm afraid I can't talk too much about it. But yeah, uh, people are definitely using it to do this kind of stuff. Okay. I'm guessing we're good. All right, so I guess it's time to go out and enjoy the sun and the sports ball. See you guys.